Well, hi everybody, I'm John, and I heard you liked design patterns, so we're gonna keep on talking about those. Um, so, got my first uh, Ruby job in 2011, and you've seen, you see some things about uh, how people decide to organize the code. Uh, live in Lions, have a couple kids, a couple dogs. We're here Gusto, we're here sponsoring, hiring, talk to us. Um, this is Annie and Maggie, and I would love to just show you pictures of my dogs, but today we're gonna talk about ways to organize code, holy wars, and why naming is the only thing that really matters. Um, so, just to make sure everybody was on the same page, let's talk about the default organization for Rails applications. So these are sort of the architectural components that Rails comes with. Model view controller, or MVC. So, a model is gonna wrap the database table and provide some abstraction for just loading and persisting data. The view is the template that gets turned into HTML and is then sent to the user. And uh, the controller is the middleman just interpreting the request from the browser, often doing something with a model to get or persist data, and then results shown to the user via a view. So this is sufficient data, or this is sufficient structure for many applications, but we're gonna talk about some ways to augment this foundation, which can help as your application grows in complexity, your team grows in size, and you just find changes increasingly difficult and risky. So, I'm gonna jump in and play with something that almost all applications have to deal with, letting users sign up. So we're gonna start with the basic approach and then look at some other options. So here's our controller. We have this create method. We uh, get the user's name, email, password, create the record, immediately sign them in. So great, that works, easy to follow, but surprise, surprise, requirements are going to change. So we've got spammers coming in and we need to make people confirm their email before they can sign in. So, all right, instead of signing them in immediately, we're now gonna send them an uh, email and then redirect them, telling them to go check their email. So that'll work, but what if there's a different endpoint that we want to uh, create users from? Say we have a separate API, uh, now we could copy and paste this code everywhere and then maintenance quickly becomes a nightmare as changing requirements means doing shotgun short surgery and you have to uh, change a whole bunch of code. Um, so starting with everything in the controller, simple, easy to follow, but it's gonna be harder to test because controller tests are yeah, they're, they're more moving parts than just uh, <laughs> testing uh, your plain old Ruby objects. Um, so they're not reusable and they're not gonna absorb complexity well. So what if we put it on the model? All right, so now we've got this uh, after create hook on our model. Whenever we create a user, we're also gonna send the email. Great, but all your tests are gonna run a little bit slower now because uh, every time we create a user, we're, sent, we're sending this email. And the one thing that's guaranteed in software development is changing requirements that typically get increasingly complex. It's not very often that your project manager comes to you and says, hey, we're gonna make things simpler. <laughs> so callbacks are a powerful but dangerous tool. And I'd say down this path lies madness. So you continue to add callbacks to your models. Your tests are gonna keep getting slower. And more importantly, your code's gonna to continue to get harder to reason about. They add implicit behavior to your application and explicit behavior is always gonna be easier to reason about. So these also don't absorb complexity well. Imagine the conditional email sending example. So let's say we wanna have admins be able to create sub-users and then we don't wanna make them verify their email. How do we do that? We're gonna add an adder accessor on our user model that says like skip confirmation email and then set that when we create users this way. Sure, but you're, well, you're heading down that path to madness. <laughs> um, so 
keep going this way, changes are going to get hard and just make the code increasingly convoluted and difficult to follow. Um, so having your thick models here, you know, simple, railsy, but slower tests, forced reuse, and it doesn't absorb complexity well. So I keep saying that this approach doesn't absorb complexity well, but it's hard to demonstrate thoroughly with an example that fits on a slide. Let's look at a real world example of what can happen if you don't proactively architect your application to handle additional complexity being added. Let's see if I can manage this. Okay. All right, so here's a real world user model. And I think this is gone beyond thick to being a full-fledged God model. Just, you know. Oof. Just gonna eat up the rest of my time scrolling this uh, model. <laughs> All right, let's go fast. There, that's the bottom. <laughs> All right. Where'd, where'd, my, where'd my presentation go? There we go. All right, so apologies if you've worked on this. No judgment, really, just my sincere sympathy. Um, but it is a demonstration of why this is important. So rail ships with these basic architectural components, and they're great, but you don't have to end there. So you're a software developer, you're not just somebody who runs rails and generates scaffold. So, you know, Ruby's really good at classes, methods. You can utilize these fundamental building blocks to introduce new ways of encapsulating our business logic It'd be awesome if Rails came with a business logic folder alongside models and controllers, but we have to make our own. So let's extract a class. You know, when like you're watching a movie and they say the name of the movie in the movie, that's, that's, that's this time, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so here's a basic extract a class. Where's my cursor? Do, do, do. All right, so I use a setup class here. It takes in user parameters, just has a do it method, it sends the confirmation email. If we successfully save it, and then it returns the user. Mm -hmm. um, so with this, our model goes back to knowing nothing about emails, and our controller gets simplified as well. It gives us nice dividing lines. We only need to update the controller when we want to change something that the controller is realm of responsibility, like where we redirect them after sign up. And the user signup class is in charge of all the details of what's happening when a user signs up. So when we decide that we want to post new signups in Slack or email relevant administrators, this will absorb that complexity with only minimal complaints, and it's so easy to reason about what's going on. Uh, so also put single responsibility principle in the name of this talk. So the main, it's over discussed, but so, but the main, point of it is that each class should only have one reason to change, right? So this requires reasoning about our code like humans who are aware of our business requirements, what's likely to change based on business needs, and making conscious choices regarding trade-offs of SRP, cohesion, and coupling. Taking the SRP too far could mean that simple flows in your application require holding dozens of classes in your head, but not taking it far enough could mean that you have to reason about methods that are dozens of lines long, or a user class that's thousands. Um, so by coming up with reasonable dividing lines to draw, meaning classes to create, then you set yourself up well to enable testing because it's easier to test something when it doesn't have a bunch of side effects. You enable reuse and you make it easier for new folks to get up to speed and just generally make your application more pleasant to maintain. Um, there's a simplified controller, may substantiate the uh, user signup class, call do it, check if it persists as a user, and carry on our merry way. All right, so let's talk about some more common design patterns. Might have heard of a few of them already today, but we'll uh, have another look at them. <laughs> so 
Design patterns are just standard and repeatable approaches to common issues that developers encounter. They aren't magic, and there's seldom one correct pattern for a particular issue. They're nice tools to have at your disposal, and familiarity with them can make jumping into other code bases less painful. All right, presenters, because dumb views are the best views. So here we have some sample ERB. <laughs> And when you're just passing your view an instance of your active record class, you'll find yourself being tempted to add either presentation-specific methods to your active record class or to do a lot in your view templates. Um, looking at this, you might want to add a full name and a display sign update method to the user model, but these will quickly litter your model with presentation-specific logic. And it gives us a potential single responsibility principle conflict because if we want to change the model, which should be concerned only with data fetching and persistence, but we're really just changing presentation level concerns. So using a presenter or decorator or view component, uh, we can wrap the active record instance with a class that's in charge of such things. So this gives us a nice simple view, and we keep our presentation concerns isolated from the model in their own class. The only reason to change this class is if you're concerned about presenting something uh, different with your user. Um, so we're solving the problem of complex views being hard to maintain and test. And they give us encapsulated presentation-specific logic. They keep our views simple, and they're easy to test. Form objects. So we're going to look at form objects from a slightly different perspective, where they can be really powerful for creating multiple records from the same form. Um, so you can imagine a form where we want to create two different database records and different tables, let's say a user account and a waiver acceptance. So the Rails way would be to throw accepts nested attributes on your user model and deal with it that way. This can be fine for simple use cases, but once you find your controller is getting complicated, you may want to look into form objects. Not only will it keep your model and controller clear of clutter, but it'll enable introducing custom validations that could touch both objects or context dependent, and you can enjoy being explicit about the behavior. Form objects feed the form, coordinate validations, and should ensure that persistence is transactional. Um, so here we have another form object example. Um, so we take in these user attributes and also some waiver attributes. And in our save model, save method, not only are we creating the user, but we're also creating a waiver in a transaction so that if one fails, we don't get orphaned data. Um, so here we ha now have a class where we can set up uh, our associations explicitly. We can set up uh, can delegate validations to these instances or gems out there that sort of make that easier. And these can get really complicated, but there's one place where it gets complicated and it's not in your controller, so you've got one place to maintain what happens when you submit this form. Um, so one of the problems form objects solve is having one form to create multiple things. You get explicit behavior, you get simplified controllers, and you can have custom associations, validations, put default values in there. Um, so service objects. I've already seen a service object with a previous user signup class, as well as previous uh, presentations, but let's look at our user signup class again. But the core idea is just to, to extract a class for encapsulating some functionality, making it explicit, easy to test, and reusable. So you can get into strict forms like command objects, which insist that you only have a public perform method. That approach can be nice because it ensures a consistent interface, but you don't get to write your poetry. Um, so service objects generally solving the problem of business logic needing to live somewhere. Um, it gives you one thing that knows about a flow, that are reusable and easily testable. Policies. So these are just classes that encapsulate rules. For example, can a user access a certain post? Can a post be deleted? If you have complicated rules, like a post can only be deleted within two days of it being posted, or it has no comments, or the user is administrator, then that can be nice to be encapsulated in a policy class. 
Uh, here's an example, post deletion policy class. We pass any user in a post and check if it's allowed. So looking at this, you could easily imagine there's multiple places where we care about if a user can delete a post, right? Like you care about this in your view. If we show the delete button, we care about this in the controller. When we're saying, hey, are you actually allowed to delete this post? Like, and instead of repeating it, we get this reusable class that we get to use everywhere. So we're solving the problem of complicated rules getting repeated. Uh, we get one place to maintain the rules, and uh, it's reusable and testable. Query objects. So this is generally just handled by scopes. But if you have a complicated set of scopes that you need in multiple places that is nameable, and that's perhaps the most important thing here, is that it represents a concept that's worthy of its own name. Um, so here we have our sleepy puppies query object. Um, so you know, if our application is really, if sleepy puppies is a central theme in our application, we can promote it to this first class citizen, this, this object all of its own. And now it's easier to talk about sleepy puppies. So we're solving the problem of having lots of repeated scope chaining. Um, we get a concept that's encoded at the top level and we get one place to update that concept. Value objects, also referred to today as data objects and virtual domain objects. Uh, so yet another term for them. <laughs> if nothing else, you will leave here with your buzz, buzzword bingo card filled out. Um, so these give you a nice defined interface for data. They can also make your interfaces explicit instead of passing active record models around with their extensive interfaces. As the number of developers working the same code base grows, so does the value in limiting the interface of objects that get passed around. If you want to make it clear what you can and cannot do with the value returned by a method, reach for a value object. Um, if you return an active record instance, the calling code can do anything with it. If you return a value object, they just get the data that you're intentionally providing. They're particularly valuable in code bases that are being modularized with something like Packwork, which we uh, might have just, I'm here to just say, yeah, that, that was, that's right. <laughs> uh, so when you expose a public interface with some domain groups, um, the, the, keeping things like your active record models private can be a forcing function for developing solid public <laughs> interfaces and ensure that consumers don't do anything untoward with your private concerns. It also just keeps things simple. Here's the data. You don't need to be able to update it, at least not without going through our, our public interface, where we can do appropriate checks and trigger any intended side effects. Um, simple example, just here's a struct, and it knows how to construct itself from the model. And uh, yeah, so. We're helping to solve the problem of large applications ending up with everything coupled to everything. We get a limited exposed interface and we force better API design between boundaries. Repositories. So this is the final one I'm going to talk about, probably my favorite. Um, repositories provide a nice way to get data. Um, two big use cases for it are limiting access to only appropriate data that the user is authorized to see and enable eager, eager loading of data and avoiding N plus ones. So here we have an example of a repository to ensure that the user can only get access to pets that are either public or owned by them. So sort of wrapping the active record interface here, we get authorization built in. So if we only access our pets going through this repository, then we should not get anybody snooping on data that they shouldn't be able to see. Keep this private pets private. All right, so now we're combining the idea of limiting access to pets that should be visible to the current user and augmenting that information with the description of the pet's breed. So let's imagine our breed information service is calling some sort of external API to get the breed information. So we get our pets from our database, and then we wrap them in our value object 
and sort of augment that with a description of the breed, inf breed information that we get by calling this service. Um, and this is all there is to the value object that we're dealing with here. Um, all right, so looking at this again, we see that we've got an n plus one problem. For every pet, we're doing one query, one API call, wherever this breed information is coming from to get the breed information. So that's gonna be a performance problem. Um, let's zoom in on this all method, just pulling it up, same method, nothing's changed, but we're gonna need more space. So here we've extracted this description for method, which then memoizes it. So awesome, now we're no longer gonna call the breed information service with the same breed multiple times. We now have less of a performance issue. <laughs> N plus 0. 0.9. <laughs> um, but so I'm not gonna necessarily call out to the external service multiple times with the same breed. Um, Let's say our breed information service can support finding information for multiple breeds in one call. So now this is gonna be even better. Only do one maybe expensive call to the service and after that we're just fetching the descriptions from the hash. Um, by pulling this logic into a repository, it's easy to change and optimize and we only have to do it in one place. Cool. All right, so repositories are solving the problem of uh, controlling access to data and performance concerns. Um, you have this easy, dry, do not repeat yourself authorization. You can eager load data beyond using active records, includes preload, pre um, and they play well with value objects. So apologize if I may missed your favorite design pattern, love for after this, if uh, anybody has their favorite that they want to share with us, please do. Uh, so there are a lot, um, people have their favorites. Um, they all have nice use cases and can be used to help make a code base easier to reason about. They're not magic though. They need to serve you and your application's needs. The main takeaway for this talk is if you can name a concept that's currently hidden within another class, consider extracting it to its own class. We've looked at some common ways that people often choose to architect these extractions, and if it doesn't fit into the paradigm of a specific design pattern, just call it a service class. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can't name it yet, don't rush things. Preemptive refactoring will often result in pulling out code that looks like it should be its own class, but as your application continues to evolve, it turns out it wasn't really the right abstraction. You've got to figure out what your actual business concepts are that you're modeling and model those. If you end up modeling something that's a, not really your business concept, it could cause you problems down the line. It's, easier, it's often easier to extract later once you've seen a concept emerge multiple times organically. Transiently repeated code is easier to deal with than re-architecting after you've encoded concepts that don't really belong. Also, don't hurt yourself by trying to fit everything into a design pattern. A named class will improve the encapsulation of your business logic, making it reusable, testable, and easier to reason about. And uh, yes, that means you have to name it. And while you may go large portions of your career without worrying about cache and validation, you can't get away from this hard thing in computer science. All right, shifting gears from talking about code, Let's talk about people. How do you introduce a new design pattern to your code base? Most of us don't work in isolation and we often need to bring our team along with architectural changes. First, to make sure that you keep, have it clear in your head why you want to introduce a new design pattern. What are the pain points that are motivating you? How does the proposed solution help? There are lots of ways to brew coffee, lots of paths to God. What are the other options? Why is your proposal better? Um, the important thing here is that you and your team find a way forward that ensures the application is manageable for the long term, not to make everyone do you see that you're a prophet who has seen the only true path to a maintainable code base. It can be a lot easier to discuss a proposal with something concrete to look at. 
A quick proof of concept demonstrating the use of the new approach in a targeted manner can help illustrate exactly what you're talking about. It's a lot easier to talk about code than it is abstract concepts. And yet another artifact that can be helpful is creating an architecture decision record, or ADR. So this is basically writing up the motivation, the alternatives, what your proposed solution is. And this gives you yet another concrete thing that you can look at with your team to discuss. Um, if your company does not already have an ADR process, this can be a great way to introduce one. And that could also be its own talk, but looking at, um, so having a record of past ADRs helps to document the reasoning of decisions for posterity. Being able to look back and read through the motivation for architectural choices can be very illuminating to new folks in the team and it can help to encode these choices as a guide for future development as your application continues to evolve. Um, so here's your change agents checklist, change agent. Someone who wants to introduce a wide reaching change to your company, write up the proposal, including the motivation and alternatives, implement the proof of concept, Send out the meeting invitation, let folks do their pre-reading. Then you should probably talk about it, decide how to move forward, and do it. So, thanks. <laughs> That's about it um, for the reading. Any questions? Yes, Jean. All right, the question is, what do we use for ADR? We use Google Docs. <laughs> so we've got a template that has, you know, hey, here's the stuff that you should fill out. We post in Slack. We're like, hey, we want feedback from a certain day. If there's a lot of discussion about it, let's have a meeting. But yeah, uh, so the question was, if you ever unabstracted a class. So like if you, pre if you prematurely extract a class, then it turns out that you're not really modeling your domain appropriately. Yeah, no, that's why it's dangerous because uh, it does tend to live in your code base forever because, yeah, you've written your test for it, you've used it in 10 different places, and, well, it can be hard to uh, factor that out, right? Like, definitely ways that you can do it, like introduce the correct class and gradually transition to it, but then you're probably going to end up with the two classes living in your code base simultaneously forever. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's hard. <laughs> Thank you.